Good morning, everyone, and happy Friday. It's so good to see each of you. We're just taking a moment to allow all of our vodcast guests to get settled into our virtual learning space. We are always excited when people show up for these calls. We know there's a million things you could be doing on, on a Friday during this hour, but the fact that you spend it with us really makes us feel incredibly gra grateful for this community. I'm Dr. Nika White. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and you have joined Intentional Conversations podcasts where we intersect discussions regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion, and leadership and business. I will ask that you kindly take to the chat. Let us know where you're joining the conversation from. It's always a treat for us to see where people are joining. And usually it's all over the globe, which is exciting for us. And if you feel so inclined, you know, be sure to share other information about yourself, maybe the organization that you're representing today, um, or perhaps your LinkedIn information, if you desire for this community to connect with you beyond this hour of time. Cameras doing our Intentional Conversations podcast are encouraged and welcomed, but certainly not required. It is a way to help us to get proximate to each other in this virtual learning environment. But we realize that many will join just for the auditory capacity, and we're glad you're here nonetheless. And so sit back, relax, and uh, we're so glad you're here. Again, welcome again to Intentional Conversations podcast. Great. For those, of her, for those of you who are just joining us, again, I'm Dr. Nico White, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I serve as the founder and lead principal consultant of NWC, and I am being supported today by a number of my colleagues who are just exceptional in helping us to deliver a great experience for each of you that join us every Friday for our vodcast. And so as per usual, I want to remind you that we do also have our vodcasts available in a podcast capacity as well. So if you know of individuals that like to get their contact, contact content and uh, a podcast capacity, let them know they should check out Intentional Conversations. And we will continue to welcome each of you live in our podcast experience, but we also just want you to know that um, this is another opportunity for you to encourage others to join this community. So while July is wrapping up, this has been um, the, the Disability Pride Month, and we want to continue to amplify it. But I want you to know that once August hits, we still have a responsibility, right? Let's make sure that we're doing our part to help um, amplify disability justice. One of the ways in which we do that at NWC is we make sure that these virtual vodcast experiences are um, enabled with um, closed captioning. So if that's something that's useful for you, we hope that you will take advantage of it as you join and participate with our community today. So as per usual, we like to give you a little bit of what you have to look forward to in future weeks by way of our guest co-host on Intentional Conversations. So on next Friday, the first one kicking off for August, we have Dante King joining us. And for that podcast, we're going to be talking about the construction of white supremacy and anti-Blackness in American culture and identity. So I hope that you will join us on that first Friday in August. And if you can't join us then, I want to go ahead and have you to save the date for the remaining Intentional Conversations podcast for August, and you'll see the names of our guests that are going to be joining us, including Jared Carroll, Jen Fry, Lisa Jail Balder. So I hope that you will mark your calendars and be here to be with us. And by the way, if you have a person in mind that you think would make for a tremendous guest co-host for our podcast, we invite you to share that information with us. Let us know. We are currently mostly recruiting for Q1 of 2023. We have the majority of all of our guest co-hosts secured for the remainder of the year, maybe one or two spots left. And so, but we welcome your recommendations. Maybe it's you, maybe it's someone that's a colleague or a peer or someone that you admire. We want to know who they are. We want to extend an invite to them to join us for a conversation. Now, last but not least, you know what we do here on Intentional Conversations podcast. We take a moment to officially introduce and formally introduce our guest co-hosts by letting you know all of their accolades, their credentials, their experience, and how in which they show up to this work. And then momentarily, I will invite my guest co-host to unmute herself and to greet you all in her own way. And 
Today's guest is Cosette Strong. Cosette's career at the um, at the intersection of Jedi, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion began almost 20 years ago when she started leveraging her educational background, acquired skills, and lived experience to tell her story that amplifies the voices of herself as well as others. Since then, her impact has grown as she's progressed and brought in her DEI subject matter knowledge and skill as a strategic consultant a learning architect, a facilitator, and human performance coach. Cosette is especially passionate about the intersection of DEI and leadership development and specializes in mentoring, coaching, and training others to communicate more inclusively, to manage relationships intentionally, and articulate their personal brand and value proposition clearly. Her life is fueled by the unwavering belief that inclusive and equitable cultures are not born by accident, but are intentionally created by combining deep knowledge, home skill, bold courage, and immovable will. She is known as a results-driven leader whose work with clients across the tech, finance, beauty, automotive, and professional services industries has been called impactful, life-changing, empowering, and dynamic. And one of the greatest opportunities that I've been looking forward to today with having Cosette as my guest co-host is that I also get to introduce her as the newest member of the NWC team. She has joined us serving as a senior director of DEI strategy and design. And we have really benefited just in a short period of time by her contributions. And so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. And Cosette, I am going to add you as a spotlight and I would just love for you to greet this audience in your own way. And I'm not going to let you off the hook because you are a colleague. In fact, one of the things that you may have experienced from before when you've joined the podcast is that we always like to make sure once we read the official bio that we give our guest co-hosts an opportunity to then share some additional information about themselves. And particularly, we're looking for ways in which we can better know how you show up to this work, maybe some intersecting identities that shapes the way in which you influence the way you do this work, some tidbits of fun facts that maybe we would not find out just by reading your bio. So welcome, and we look forward to being in conversation with you today. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. By the time this podcast is over, my cheeks are going to be hurting from smiling. <laughs> um, it is lovely to be here with my amazing colleagues. I even see some friends. Shout out to um, also my sister who is online. I'm looking at her gorgeous face right now. Hi, Lindsay. Um, I uh, am so excited to be here. I feel like um, I know actually that this work is my purpose. And, uh, and I, I want to tell a, a small story story and share uh, a, a little known fact. People who are very close to me know that I have a particular affinity and love for worms. And that is something that a lot of people are very surprised by. But I see your face, Rochelle. I see you uh, smiling. And, and I hope that you'll continue to smile as I tell this story. Um, my mom has told me, as I you know, have kind of gotten to know more about my purpose and, and being in this DEIB space, she said, well, this has always been within you, Cosette. And so when I was younger, she uh, will often tell me about a conversation we had when I was three years old. And I remember it started raining and I was outside and I noticed that the worms were dying during the rain. And I, and I was upset and I was moved to tears. And I said, what's, what's happening? I don't, this is not fair. Why is this happening? And she said, well, you know, it's because when it rains, the worms come out of the ground and the water then drowns them. And I said, well, that's, that's not okay. That's not fair. I don't like that. And so she said, from then on, when I would notice that it was raining outside, I would take my, my raincoat and my rain boots from the hook by the door and I would put them on and I would march outside and I would try to save as many worms as I could. And so I tell that story to say that this work has been part of me, put in me from the beginning. And, um, and you know, at, at my, my, my wise and older age, I still go out in the rain to this day and I save worms. And my mom uh, likes to say, you know, you, you still save the worms. She said, they're, they're just humans now. You just learned how to do it in a different way than your three-year-old self could, could even imagine and fathom. And so that is, uh, you know, a little quirky fact about me, um, but something that, um, that I hold a 
very close to my heart because it tells me that this work is my purpose and always has been. Oh my goodness. I'm pausing because I just want to take in that story. What a beautiful story that you shared with us. Thank you so much for, for that gift. And um, I, I will never see us as the, the same anymore because I'm going to think about, you know, what worm is now compromised and what do I need to do? How do I translate that into the human experience? And you're right. That's, that's a lot of what we do as practitioners in this work. We try to make sure we are addressing systems, policies, procedures, and culture so that we can um, save people, you know, and I use that 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 term, that phrase, save people broadly. But mm -hmm. yeah, that is that is beautiful. You also have twins, and so I think yes. that's an interesting fun fact. I've always yes. thought it would be fun to have twins, and so <laughs> I get hammered when you shared that with me. So, do you want to also share that with this audience? Yes, yes. Uh, I uh, live near Columbus, Ohio. I have three children. My daughter Larissa is 20. She will be a junior at Ohio University. Uh, my twin boys, Christian and Caleb, are 16, and they will be juniors in high school. Um, one of the things that's really interesting about my family is we are a very creative, artistic, musical family. Our, our home is very lively and noisy, filled with Broadway sounds and uh, sound of my kids harmonizing, you know, in three parts. Sometimes I will join in. Uh, my son Caleb is a percussionist, so often he will take out his, his drumsticks and start drumming, you know, and, um, you know, it's, it's, great to be uh, part of a family like that. It's, it's taken me a little while to really um, embrace my identity as a creative, uh, but that is uh, definitely a lens through which I look when I approach this work. Um, I really like to use, um, you know, art, history, music, culture, when talking with people about diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, justice, um, just to try to you know, also put on my, my learning hat and try to help everyone learn and engage with, with this space and this work in their own way so that the, the intersection of mindset, um, heart, and behavior uh, can, can really uh, gel. And if someone wants to, you know, go about their life connecting with other humans in a different way to advance this work um, in the way that they can uh, interact with it and affect it, um, I want to assist with that. No, I love that. I think that's really important. And I think it also what makes you unique and how you show up to this work in this space. You know, there's so many practitioners. And I think that sometimes we get into this, this, you know, mindset that we all have to do it the exact same way, right? And certainly, I do believe in standards, I do believe in um, having some best practices that we all are, are kind of coalescing around. But I also think that the creativity and how we solve for, you know, helping clients on this journey is really important. And so, um, one last fun fact about yourself, which kind of captures what you just shared with us, is that I also know that um, you have love of baking and you are a past pastry chef. And so uh, I just want to bring that to the conversation. I'm really big on making sure that we get to know kind of the whole person. You know, sometimes it's all about the business, right? But you know, it's hard for us to separate um, the work that we do with the organizations we are affiliated with and then the human side of us and our life outside of work. And so help us to just have a splice of Cosette's life as it relates to being a pastry chef. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I like to refer to myself as, as the accidental business owner. I never um, intended to go into entrepreneurship in, in the culinary industry. Um, but when I, uh, you know, had my boys, and I used to be a special ed teacher, as we, you know, may talk about in a moment, um, and then uh, my husband and I found out that we were pregnant with twins, that was a radical shift in, in my identity, because what it meant was this job that I, that I loved, um, that I had gone back to school to, you know, acquire the licensure to get, uh, it didn't really make sense anymore when I had to think about, you know, family versus career. So I left the workforce uh, during that time, you know, traded in my, my Mitsubishi for a minivan, you know, and lost a very, uh, you know, a part of my identity that I had really come to, to rely on and depend on. Um, and when my sons were were one, I made a cake for my daughter's uh, school. And from then on, I just started getting calls and people asking me to make cakes. And I, I remember being in a conversation and saying, I'm 
I'm really not sure how you got my phone number. I am, I am not a, a business. And, uh, you know, the woman that I was talking to, she said, I, I, I really need this. I'm desperate. You know, I will pay you. And I thought, you know, this might be a fun thing to engage in. It might be a fun hobby. Um, and as we know, um, in, you know, certain areas, if it is meant to be, it is going to be. And so that Thing that I thought would be a fun hobby uh, really ballooned into a business that um, I owned and operated uh, for seven years under the name uh, The Cake Chick. I ended up uh, making a, a lot of cakes, uh, cake pops, cupcakes, um, all kinds of things. And uh, one of the things that I really loved was being able to take my, my creativity and, and make amazing flavors, things that not only delighted the taste buds, but delighted you know the, the visual senses as well. And um, so that was really fun. And, and even though I'm not actively involved in that anymore, um, I, I still I still make cakes and things for people on occasion. My nephew just turned one and I, I made his first year birthday cake. Um, so it's, it's nice to have that to, to fall back on. And, and I learned so uh, I learned so many things during that time. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. And, and also all my kids can make any of you on the phone with us right now a wedding cake any of them. Wow. So I awesome. put them to work. I put my kids to work for sure. I love it. So, yeah. so colleagues at NWC that are listening in, we're taking all these notes, right? We're taking <laughs> notes <laughs> and we're learning all of the great skill sets that you have. Um, that's wonderful. So thanks for giving us kind of the different slices of, of yeah. Cosset Strong's life. So can you tell us a little bit about your background? I mean, obviously I read your bio, but I want us to go a little bit deeper. What led you to begin DEIB work, you know, 20 years ago? Obviously we know the, the warm story and how that's always been something that, that you felt a strong connection to, but how how did you actually begin to put that mindset and the sentiments and the desire for, for the connectivity to this work and to practice? Yeah, thank you. Um, so um, after I graduated undergrad, you know, I, I went into state government work here in Ohio and I worked for what is now known as the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities. At the time, it was the Ohio Department of MRDD. And I worked in communications. And during that time, I had the opportunity to work very closely with the deaf and special education communities. Mm -hmm. I fell in love. I fell in love. It felt like um, this was what I had been waiting for. It felt like the place where I was supposed to be, you know, that homey feeling yeah. that you have. And it's like, this, this is it. And um, that's when I decided to go back to school to pursue my master's in special education, because I, you know, I, I love children. I love educating people. I now, you know, had love for this community. I was speaking fluent sign language. I was teaching my daughter all of these things. And I thought, I want to be a special ed teacher. And so that um, that's really, you know, with the Ohio Department of DD, where I, I was able to take um, this, this thing that I felt the sense of purpose, and and really, um, you know, invest in it with with work. And, um, and that's that's only grown as I've as I've uh, progressed. You know, I, I still stay very closely connected to the special ed community, um, the deaf community here, a number of other uh, communities that I'm you know that I intentionally ally myself with, uh, because I really think when when we think about this space, when we think about this work, you know, it's not what we do, it's who we are, and yeah. so um, so there are some non-negotiable values and competencies that that I um, that I hold very closely um, that I align myself with as a core part of my identity. I love that. And so speaking of the disabilities community, Tuesday was the anniversary, of course, of the Americans with Disability Act. Mm -hmm. So I want to bring that into the conversation. How can more organizations address the many intersecting identities of employees, particularly when you consider the invisible disabilities, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that employees don't feel erased. Yes, yes. Um, I am a big fan of the term psychological safety. Mm -hmm. And this term was coined by Amy Edmondson, I believe. And, uh, and you know, other people have, have taken their own spins on it. But, you know, um, 
I think that people often mistake psychological safety for the for uh, you know comfort. It's not the same as comfort. It is the same as treating each other with respect and charity, with grace and positive regard. And when we think about the four types of psych safety, when we think about inclusion safety, learner safety, contributor safety, challenger safety, yes. in order to really promote environments and cultivate workspaces and personal environments of inclusion and belonging, we must cross lines of difference so that we can intentionally invest in human connection. Yes. You know, um, I, I like to, I, I like to put my, my journalism hat on and I say, you know, behind the lens of every eye is a story just waiting to be told. You know, when you think about all of the people, you know, if you're walking down a street, all of the people you pass in a given day, you know, each person you rub shoulders with has a story and, when we think about, um, you know, these, these um, things that we need innately as humans, you know, to, to be included, to be able to feel like we're a part of something, to be able to learn and progress and grow in the ways that work for us, to be able to contribute as, you know, part of a collective or part of a community, and to be able to, to challenge, to be able to uh, share our points of view, to be able to question, to be able to, you know, make a mistake, because it's not... Right. Uh, if we're going to make a mistake, it's when that's part of the human condition. And so when you think about those things and the psychological safety, we need that. We need that just like we need shelter, like we need water, like we need air. And I think that a lot of times um, people overlook our need for belonging. And that is when psychological safety, when psychological safety isn't present, for one thing, you know, we cover we cover, right? We we tone down maybe disfavored aspects of our of ourselves to fit in space, as I like to say, to twist ourselves into a you know Simone Biles like pretzel, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, and 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 that that has a toll. It takes a toll on us. Dr. Kenji Yoshino uh, coined yeah. that term, covering, mm -hmm. and, yes. and you know just really talking about the the adverse effects that that covering um, have on on humans. And when we think about relationships, the most effective relationships don't need covering because they're rooted in trust and belonging, and that's what leads to psych safety. Psych safety equals trust and belonging. That's a formula that I, that I like to, to use. And so I think leaders of organizations, you know, we, we cannot um, overlook our need for leadership development in, in our workspaces. We can't overlook our need for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in our workspaces uh, because DEI is a part of, of well-being is a part of constructing workspaces uh, that are inclusive, you know, where people can feel like they can, uh, you know, learn and contribute and challenge and be, uh, you know, be a full authentic part of, of their, their communities at, at work and beyond. Yeah, Cosette, there was so much richness in um, the, the commentary that you just shared. I want to amplify a couple things because it also was resonating with our audience. And you, as you were talking about psych safety, psychological safety, you mentioned four key components of that. Inclusion safety, learner safety, challenger safety, and contributor safety. And so we had some folks um, that were really wanting to make sure they had all those captured. So I wanted just to repeat them for the benefit of this group. And yes, when you were talking about covering and masking in the workplace, as you referenced, Kenji Yoshino, that has been a study that I know many practitioners continue to bring to the conversations of psych safety, but we have to also dig into why is that important? Why is psych safety important? It certainly helps to fuel that sense of validation, that sense of acceptance, that sense of that connectivity, right? And it helps people to show up authentically and at their best, because if not, and they can't do that, they're going to conform to mainstream way of thinking. And then that totally defeats the whole purpose purpose of the strength of diversity, right? If everyone's thinking alike, no one's really thinking. They're just conforming. They're assimilating. And so I think that it's always important for us to remind ourselves of, of, of the need for us to build spaces that allow for people to show up really authentically. Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. Yeah, that's really, really good. So, you know, going back to people wanting to be able to bring their authentic selves and to show up as their best selves in different environments, when organizations say that they support that, 
um, how can they prepare to make sure that all employees are safe? I want to get to a point to where as we start, as we continue with these broadcast communities that we are leveraging as much opportunity as possible to not only just transfer knowledge to where people kind of get the facts, but I want them to also be able to translate that into practice. And so give us a little bit of maybe some tips that you think are really important for organizational leaders to be mindful of mm -hmm. to help prepare and to ensure employee psych safety. Mm -hmm. I love this. I love the intersection of DEIB and leadership development, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's really inclusive leadership is what we're mm -hmm. talking about Absolutely. and ways to enhance, you know, psychological safety. I think leading with authority is one thing, but leading with inclusive authority is another, you know, so often, uh, you know, I think that uh, leaders feel like they have to have all the answers and they have to be responsible for, you know, the, you know, steering the ship solely. And there's a reason you have a team. There's a reason why you let others in and, you know, getting others perspectives and opinions, not only promotes, you know, diversity, but allows a, a leader to, like you said, not just have that one perspective. There is such danger in the power um, of a single story, right? right? There's such danger in that. And, and I noticed in the chat, you know, leading through vulnerability. Absolutely. That was going to be my second one. I'm a big fan of Brene Brown, who has a yeah. talk on vulnerability. I consider vulnerability one of the highest forms of bravery. Letting, letting that guard down and saying, you know what? I do not know this. I need assistance. I need to be able to uh, have some, you know, some help here. I think that not only humanizes leaders, but I think that it strengthens human connection in, in the workplace. Um, I think that when leaders also let adults be autonomous beings, that is important. And we're, we've seen a lot of this during the pandemic, right? As, as yeah, workspaces yeah. are trying to figure out, you know, do we return to the office? Do we let people have fully remote workspaces? Do we have a hybrid approach? You know, what do we do? You know, letting adults really be in charge of their own lives to, to mm -hmm. manage their own schedules, to have the work-life blend that works for them, not necessarily what works for the leader or the manager is so important. When I think about how we treat other people, you know, we oftentimes, um, you know, go toward the golden rule, right? And I, I really uh, like the platinum rule. So instead of talking about treat others as you want to be treated, treat others as they yes. want to be treated. Um, and so I, when I think about, you know, autonomy, which is one of my core values and letting adults be autonomous beings as a leader, I think that is so important. I also think getting to know your teammates, really getting to know them in um, not just in a, Hey, how was your weekend? Great. Mine was, was good too, but truly getting to know them, um, in a way that, uh, that is intentional, right? That, that story that I talked about before that makes such a difference. Um, and then I also, you know, want to add, uh, two other things, feedback, giving feedback and learning how to model getting feedback, you know, with, mm -hmm. with humility and, and readiness is mm -hmm. so important. There are so many of us who've experienced workplaces where we have not, uh, where we haven't gotten feedback. And then, you know, we're, you know, we're faced with, with a moment where if we had been given some, some quality feedback, if we had been uh, brought into that conversation, uh, that workspace, that, that community, that, that experience would be much better for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing is emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. I love EQ work and feel like, um, you know, when we, when we uh, combine interpersonal intelligence and personal intelligence, that's when we get emotional intelligence. Personal intelligence is really that self-awareness, that self-regard and uh, self-management, right? How yes. our feelings and attitudes come out in our behaviors. And then that interpersonal intelligence, that's awareness of others, that's regard for others and behavior management when we think about the behaviors that others are exhibiting. And so a, a good leader makes sure that they are able to have those two columns of interpersonal intelligence and personal intelligence and to continue to work on those from both vantage points. 
so rich, so rich. So I want to I want to shift a little bit, and I want to talk about how organizations can create a compassionate culture because a lot of what you were speaking to is certainly gets to the heart of humanity and respect. Right? We don't get to to we need to go deeper than just the surface as we're getting to know our colleagues and our peers to build and cultivate those relationships. But I want you to touch specifically on how can organizations do that effectively? Again, create this compassionate culture, but also within the confines of policies and those non-negotiables that are really critical to the core essence of how the organization operates. Mm -hmm. I, I love that you said, you know, go beneath the surface. I think a lot of times people will say, well, I, you know, I was sympathetic for that person. I expressed, you know, sadness. I expressed emotion around what they were going through, or, you know, I tried to stand beside them in that way. I think that there is a big difference between sympathy empathy and compassion. So, you know, sympathy really is feeling for another person. You know, you're going through something I feel for you. Empathy is trying to uh, challenge yourself to see it through their perspective, kind of to put yourself in their shoes. And I believe that compassion is that empathy plus action. And so while I, um, you know, obviously we have policies, we have procedures, we have standards, we have things that are in places, uh, they're put in place for a reason. Mm -hmm. But I think that being intentional with cultivating that compassionate environment means, you know, talking with others, thinking through, okay, we are coming up with this, uh, you know, uh, PTO, paid time off, you know, vacation policy. What does that look like? You know, I remember, um, you know, someone um, that I coached, she, um, she had a family member die, it was her grandmother. And so she went, um, you know, to her to her manager to ask for time off for the for the services. Mm -hmm. And the manager said, um, who, who in your family died? And she said, my grandmother, and her manager said, oh, we only provide bereavement leave for immediate family members and, you know, dismissed her and said, no, you can't do it. The thing that that manager failed to learn is that this person's grandmother was in essence, her mother, this person had raised her. And so to, to dismiss her with that callousness due to, you know, what policy or procedure says, uh, that's a, that's a human misstep, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so I believe that the, the story that I talked about before and really proactively, um, you know, forming those policies, forming those procedures and going about those things with thought and intention is one way to make sure that we are bringing that inclusive leadership to the table as we are, you know, forming organizations and as we are cultivating those uh, environments of, of inclusion and belonging. No, absolutely. This is so good. And like you, Cosette, I also have um, been exposed to situations where people within their organizations have been really taken back, challenged, harmed, and triggered by um, the ways in which policies can um, eliminate the, the the humanity, right? And so, and to your point, you know, an organization in order to run effectively, you have to have those standards. You have to have those guiding expectations that you're really clear about, right? In your communications. But one of the, the ways that I think that so many organizations can help ensure that they are um, aligning a, a culture of compassion to their policies and their standards is just in how in the way they're communicating them. Are you going back and you reevaluating maybe what a policy was prior that has just from a legacy standpoint been um, sustained and it really needs to be revisited. Another example that's similar to the bereavement um, example that you gave is someone um, had mentioned that there was a request to prove the, the death of, of, of a loved one. And, and it was, well, what are you asking for? What do you want exactly? Do you want, you want a picture? Do you want a death certificate? What do, I mean, I'm grieving right now. What are you asking for? Right. And so I think sometimes um, it just also requires the intentionality of let's go back and take a look at our policies, mm -hmm. revisit them with the lens of DEIB, humanity, and let's be much more intentional to make sure that we are um, pursuing this in a way that really helps us to make sure that we are we are protecting people's well-being. So Absolutely. I love that you brought that example. And there's probably lots of examples like that, even outside of bereavement, that I think really, um, you know, deserve some greater attention. 
Mm-hmm. You know, this idea of empathy, you've mentioned Brene Brown a couple of times. I'm a, I'm a fan of Brene Brown as well. She talks a lot about in, empathy, vulnerability, and perspective taking. Yes. And um, so it brought to mind to me when you were saying sometimes we have to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. So it's not just treat someone how we want to be treated, but we have to treat them how they want to be treated. But first, that requires us knowing how they want to be treated. Yes. And again, that's where the surface relationship is not going to necessarily help drive that result. We have to ask deeper questions, allow the curiosities we're holding about people that we want to build and cultivate relationships with to force us to, to, to deepen those relationships so that we do have that clear understanding. We make a lot of assumptions right now, and I think that's really also hurting this humanity aspect of, of society that I think we really, we really want to see. We do. Yeah. I, I yeah. agree. I think when, when people are, you know, when people are stressed, when people are overworked yeah. and they're burned out, when they feel isolated and lonely without a sense of value, first of all, that impacts our, our well-being, our, our mental, right. emotional, physical, and spiritual well-being. Absolutely. And it's also impossible to bring your full self to work, but there, there can be that conflict, you know, when, when people are encouraged to bring their full selves to work, when they are encouraged to be transparent and maybe a little vulnerable. And, you know, I've, I've been in situations and, and heard of situations where people do that. They, they, they feel like that trust is there, you know, like that yeah. psychological safety is there and, and maybe they are a little vulnerable and, and we, we have to make sure as leaders that we are um, not only tolerating or accepting that, but embracing it and that we are not um, punishing or penalizing people for doing the thing that we told them to do. And that's when we have environments that, you know, we want to be psychologically safe, but then turn into psychologically dangerous environments. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm very, I'm very fascinated by the intersection of DEIB and well-being, especially since uh, the pandemic and seeing, uh, you know, seeing how that has played out when we think about, um, you know, uh, people in the workforce. Yeah. So let's talk about some of those wellness efforts and initiatives um, that organizations should have top of mind. Um, I, I did a session yesterday. We did a session yesterday in WC for a group, and it was about meeting the moment. And as an introduction to um, this broadened conversation of DEI, it was really to help get the participants to begin to feel more comfortable just engaging and having hard conversations. You know, there's a lot of social complex issues that we are faced with every single day. And to believe that those things are not impacting how we're showing up to the workplace um, is a bit misguided. And so, you know, bringing those conversations in in a way to where we're dealing with them by navigating with community is so important. We aren't really designed to be by ourselves. We are designed to do these these hard things in community. And the workplace should certainly be a community. So I'm interested to hear your perspective, Cosette, on ways in which you like to coach organizations to think about centering that whole well-being and and the wellness efforts into the culture of the organization. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, if we just talk about workload, workload in itself, you know, um, not everyone has the same work style, not everyone has the same communication style, not everyone likes every single task uh, right. that is put on their plate. And, and when I say the word likes, I don't mean, you know, preference, but you know, right. where, where are you your best self? Where are you able yes. to really bring your best self? And I think that leaders should take the time to figure that out to really invest in their people in that way to ask those deeper questions like you like you said um i think when we uh, think about uh conflicting demands and lack of role clarity leaders can do their best in order to figure out what it is that they need on their teams so that they can put the right people in the right seats. When you don't have the right people in the right seats, you have people who end up being frustrated, they end up being resentful, and then performance, morale, uh, productivity, those things go down. And oftentimes it's it's not necessarily because of the employee. Sometimes it's because of, you know, leadership. Um, I think also, you know, allowing people to be autonomous in their own work lives. And what I mean by that is letting them have a voice in decisions. 
you know, involving them in the conversation, letting them have some influence over the way the job is done, letting them speak to, you know, this, this is a way that I, you know, it's something I'd like to try, you know, um, and, and incorporate that into the ways of working in a, in a seamless way, incorporate that consistently. Um, also, when organizations have a lot of change, and, and we're seeing it, and we're seeing it all over, when organizations have a lot of change, being transparent about that communication, as transparent as leadership can be uh, with that communication, alleviating fear so that people yeah. don't feel insecure around their jobs, insecure around the state of, you know, the organization so that they feel like, you know, they're still valuable, they still have a place. Um, and if they don't, really handling that conversation in the proper way as well. Um, I find that there's uh, a lot of ineffective communication, you know, a lot of uh, lack of support from management in that way. That's one reason why I'm, I'm fascinated by different communication styles and uh, thinking preferences. Um, and I know you and I, Nika, have, to have talked about whole brain thinking from Herman Institute yeah. and the Herman Brain Dominance Instrument, which is something when we think about inclusive communication is an amazing tool to help strengthen organizations and teams. Um, and I think lastly, you know, we need to have um, some no tolerance policies when it comes to specific things. I have coached people and been involved with uh, consulting to organizations where, you know, some harassment and abuse has been able to go forward and these environments are you know they're toxic and you know leaders need to uh be very cognizant and aware of uh monitoring for that especially in this in this hybrid uh workforce time where where people are trying to find the flexibility that that works for them and where I may have different flexibility and style than you have and, and how do we navigate through those differences and, and make sure that we're more collaborative and that we're not conflicting. Yeah, so much to, to comment on that resonated with me from from what you just shared. The first is the communication piece, you know, um, my team has heard me say several times that clarity is kind. Yes. They've also heard me say that there's a need to over communicate in many situations, especially when you're thinking about this distributed workforce that so many organizations find themselves in right now. So I appreciated how you brought that to the conversation. And then the change management piece, Vicky Gonzalez kind of, you know, also commented on this in the chat, but yes, change management has to be a part of this work of DEIB because it is a process that creates a lot of questions and curiosities, people begin to formulate their own narrative about it. And sometimes it's influenced by misinformation, right? So that automatically creates this negative connotation around, well, what does this mean for me? What's going to be taken for me? So communication and that change management is critical. I also took note of the no tolerance. I tend to say non-negotiables, but I think I kind of like the no tolerance as well. There are those things to where organizations have to be really steadfast and we will not tolerate this, period, full stop, right? And sometimes I think the fuzziness is what creates a challenge because it's like, well, you say that you want this type of environment, but then you're tolerating this behavior, right. which is very much an opposite of, of cultivating the environment that we say we want to have. Mm -hmm. And then the last point that I'll just amplify is, I love how this language is coming into this conversation, but the right people in the right seats, you know, I love that too, because that also, you connected that very specifically to someone's well-being, to wellness efforts. So as organizational leaders, if we aren't very mindful to, to, to really be sure that we have the right people in the right seats, that also can compromise someone's well-being, right? Because right. if they don't like it and they don't want it or they're not equipped to really do it, we're setting them up for failure. That yeah. creates, to your point, resentment. It creates this, this wall, this barrier. Mm -hmm. And that's not healthy for um, an organizational culture. Yeah. They have to get it, want it, and have the capacity to do it and be supported to do it. So I, I love all of that. Okay, yeah. so I'm going to ask one final question. And before I do so, I want to um, alert the audience that we're going to shift after this next question. I'm giving you just a moment to think about what contributions you want to make to this conversation or questions you have um, for Cosette as our guest co-host. Um, so I will invite you to raise your hand if you have a question. I will spotlight you, let you unmute yourself and present it live. Or if you desire to have your question presented for you, you can just go to the chat, place it there, and we will certainly bring it to our, our dialogue. Um, so here's, here's my question before I shift to, to the audience. You are also an ally to the LGBTQ community. 
Can you tell us about the article you have coming out about this relationship and what has influenced your connectivity as, as an ally and advocate of the LGBTQ community? Yes, thank you uh, so much. Um, you know, I, I am, I've been an ally to the LGBTQIA plus community for, for more than a decade. And, and the interesting thing about allyship that I think that, uh, you know, we all need to, to know is that, you know, I, I don't get to say right. I'm an ally here, you know, a, a person from a member of the community needs to right. say that to you. And, and I, you know, when I think about the intersection of allyship and narrative storytelling, um, I started thinking about how I could be more present in my community here in Columbus, Ohio, and kind of um, combine and integrate those things. And so, um, you know, I, I have a, um, a series, you know, coming out, um, an interview series uh, mm -hmm. that that combines that that allyship in the community and how are people, uh, you know, uh, who are how are people who are not um, a part of that community, how are they intentionally allying themselves with the community to amplify their voices, to create visibility for them, to, to show up for them, um, mm -hmm. and to, to really um, advance that, um, you know, here in, in Columbus, Ohio. So I will have the opportunity to interview people in the community and, um, you know, hear their stories around what they're doing to, uh, to amplify the voices of, of others within that community. Community. I'm really excited about it. No, I love that. And we'll have to talk about some creative ways to be able to bring some of that data to this podcast community and beyond, because I think it can be incredibly useful. Okay, so now we're turning to our audience questions. Pavana, it's always good to see you. Thanks so much for being here. I am going to add you as a spotlight. Feel free to unmute yourself and share. All right. Thank you. Good morning, family. Uh, always wonderful to be here always great content. So one, congratulations, uh, Cassette and uh, the NWC family for the new collaboration of talent. So as you talk a lot about psychological safety, well, first, I love the four different components of psychological psychological safety that is gonna, I'm gonna have to dive deeper into that. Love to follow up with you on that. And then along that same uh, concept, I was having a conversation with a, uh, a friend of mine and we were talking about somebody in particular situation and this person didn't particularly feel like they were accepted by their own community and yet mm -hmm. they were responsible for trying to help with DEI. And so um, it came to light that, what about having a therapist on site as a part of mm -hmm. a true DEIB program because mm -hmm. as we've all connecting all of the conversation change management DEI is in many cases change is trying to change people's fun foundational morals values and ideals so have you seen or heard of this concept of having a psychological or mental health professionals specifically allocated on site for mm -hmm. these types of things and where what types of successes have you seen? Yes, I have actually seen that. Um, some of the larger uh, corporations, um, especially the ones that are founded here in Columbus, I know of two right now, they're, they're like I said, quite large organizations, but they do have a counselor um, on site. They they have you know physical office spaces, so that remains um, you know even after the pandemic, and that has been very successful. Um, I know of other organizations where you know they may not necessarily have someone on site, especially if they're you know a remote or a hybrid workplace now. But you know, having um, a program available, an EAP program, or having um, you know something like where they will pay for a benefit for you to um, you know do uh, telehealth uh, counseling services, that has been extremely successful. I personally am a huge proponent of therapy and counseling, and feel like uh, you know you can't escape this human life without some some scars, some scratches, some wounds, and I think having 
having the ability to talk through those things, having the ability to process those things, having the ability to heal from those things, um, and having that integrated into all of your life, your whole life, not just your work life, because I don't believe that there's a sharp division there. I think that that is very beneficial. I've seen it firsthand in my life and in the lives of uh, my friends and those I work with and coach as well. So just a quick follow up. As a part of these companies, as a part of their DNI messaging, are they advocating for that or just saying, again, you kind of referenced this earlier, it's not just saying, hey, I'm giving you permission, but it's saying, I encourage you to. Yes. So is that a part of the success? Yes, there is one organization that I can think of right now that has a whole communication strategy around that and also has people in place in their uh, HR and DEI departments because in this organization they're integrated uh, as a uh, a person that you can say, you can talk to and say, this is a service that I want to sign up for. A lot of times people are scared of the possible repercussion. If they say, I, I, I need counseling or I need to talk with someone. And then, you know, there's, there's a lack of psychological safety. There's, there's gossip, there's rumor, there's, oh, well, did you hear, you know, that type of thing. So this organization has put an additional safeguard in place to say, we have one dedicated person who, if you want to come forward and, and, you know, take advantage of this service, this is the person who knows and no one else does. And so they've even put kind of policy and procedure in place around it, which has been very successful and makes people feel safe. Yeah, Thank you so much, Kwabana. I appreciate your question. Um, because that, as you were sharing, it reminded me that with the the recent announcement of Roe versus Wade and and all the complications with that, you know, a lot of employers have stepped forward in a way to um, be supportive of their of their colleagues to say we we will pay, we will cover the expenses for those that may need to travel. Mm -hmm. And one of the concerns I know that has surfaced um, for me as well as other practitioners mm -hmm. is that that's a great starting point. But how are we also making it easy for people to communicate that information because that's that's a that's can be quite intrusive to have to in yes. order to take advantage of this really disclose all of this information so as you were talking about mm -hmm. the ways in which organizations are centering well-being by having on-site mental health specialists and through their EAPs EAPs it's easier to right. um, keep that uh, that that confidentiality but when it's on site sometimes it can provide some challenges even though the intent is we're having it on site to make it convenient because we want to encourage more use of it. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to bring that to the conversation and give you a chance to comment on it. Yes, I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, you know, as you said, so many organizations are, you know, they're saying this, you know, now that this has been overturned, we will provide this. And, and it is, it, it's a great moment. I think that it's a great action. And I, um, you know, was talking with a friend of mine, he is an AVP at, at a, a large, uh, you know, bank. And, uh, you know, he said, you know, my, my company's doing this and they'll pay for, you know, someone who, you know, you can go a hundred miles, you know, if you need to. I said, I think that's great. And what do you think about the breach of confidentiality that that may bring if someone, you know, says that they need this service? He said, you know, I don't like it, but what else can we do? Well, there is something else that we there can do. There is something do. else. And, yeah. and, you know, having, you know, someone on site, a dedicated, you know, individual, a dedicated department, whatever, um, I think that that would go a long way. It's almost like being a mandated reporter, you know, when you are, you know, in education, you know, and, and that's, that's a responsibility that people should not take lightly. And I believe that that should be made a core part of this, this advocacy moment that we're in, especially, uh, you know, around Roe versus Wade and that decision, and really um, other decisions that may come after it as a result of that decisions overturning. So um, I think that that is something that more organizations can do. Um, also, it might be hard depending on the size of your organization and the financial and human resources that you have, but I think that it should be made a priority. And, you know, putting your money where your mouth is, you know, walking the walk and talking the talk, that could be a part of it as we are seeing more workplaces, uh, you know, come to uh, the aid of, of their people when it comes to their, their entire life, not just their, their professional life. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So Liz Golden, um, I see that your hand is raised. I would love to be able to bring you into the conversation. And so feel free to unmute yourself and to, to share. Thanks a lot. Um, so I'm writing because my company is located 
in Florida. And uh, we do have a DEI council. Uh, we have executive support, but the Stop Woke Act um, is now in play. <clears throat> and uh, while there isn't a huge uh, muzzle put onto the council because you know the, the things the act says we should not do are things we wouldn't do anyway you know guilt tripping people etc um, but the notion that you know we can't even suggest that racism is systemic um, you know how do we and I know everybody's just still trying to figure this out our attorneys don't and you know it's all early but have you been able to do any thinking about how we have these conversations about DEI that um, are as inclusive as possible, um, uh, that, uh, I don't, I, I'm not sure how, I, forgive me if my language isn't perfect, but okay. don't, that, that allow for those feeling disenfranchised enough to support something like the Stop Book Act to be invited into the conversation. And I don't mean people who are gonna be horrible and negative and oppressive. I just mean people who don't understand how this is for them too. Yeah. I think- Sorry for a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That is okay. Um, I, I personally believe that everyone should be invited in the conversation, whether, you know, on the outside, you look like you should be in the conversation or not. Um, I think that those, uh, you know, things that we have been talking about, that, that empathy, that compassion, uh, trying to create a sense of belonging for everyone is a space for everyone. And our language is part of that. And if there are certain words that, you know, we've been told that we can't say where we fear repercussion if we do, or the ways that we talk about things, I think we have to get creative. And I think that we have to talk about them in different ways, not in ways that harm. You know, I have heard right. that, you know, the term slavery has now been moved to involuntary relocation. Oh I my gosh. I not recommend anything like that at all. No. <laughs> so when I am talking about creativity, I mean, you know, inclusive creativity, truth telling creativity that does not uh, does not provide erasure, that does not promote invisibility, that does uh, promote community and that does speak about things in such a way where people can feel, you know, validated, exonerated, seen and heard. Nika, I'm really curious to know, uh, you know, what you think about this too. Oh, Cosette, you, you are spot on. I placed into the chat as Liz was presenting her question that certainly the Stop Woke Act is making, is adding greater complexity to our ability to do this work and do it effectively. But I totally agree. I think we have to reframe, you know, the same way that engineers and doctors and other kind of professions are having to be really innovative mm -hmm. and, and helping to catapult those industries and the work of those, of, of those industries to the next level. We have to do the same. And sometimes if that means reframing, you know, you talked about using different Different, different ways to talk about this information. I specifically amplified in the chat, truth telling creativity. I love that. Because um, yes, we cannot dismiss the truth. We have to make sure we're still speaking truth to power. And, um, but it's gonna take us not just being defeated because there was a, a stumbling block placed in our way. What else can we do? We, yes. can, we have to maintain hope. And so that's mm -hmm. one thing that I, I share to all of the um, Floridian colleagues who are in this space and in this work. Yeah. Um, so so let thank you so much for for bringing that to today's conversation yeah i invite others if there's something else that comes up for you relevant to that question please go to the chat um, so that again we can learn with and from this community we're getting close to running out of time and um, a lot of what we what we've touched on today had to do with psychological safety and of course you know the opposite of psychological safety is psychological danger mm -hmm. and that i'm mindful of how in which you really amplified the importance of storytelling right to really help us to build up our compassion and our empathy and our understanding and and our ability to stand as effective allies so as as one of the final questions today before we close out um i want you to share with us um an experience perhaps that you have had um, with psychological danger and how you've navigated that situation. And I'm hopeful that it's going to be inspiring yeah. and um, for, for, for those who are in this community. 
Yes, definitely. Thank you for the opportunity. You know, over the last couple of years, uh, you know, I have experienced a lot of change in the personal and professional realms. Um, change is challenging, I think, for all of us. It's the only constant, right? Uh, but I do think that it is challenging for all of us, some of us more than others. I feel like I've been, uh, you know, a lot of changes have been put in my life to help me get more comfortable with the uncomfortable. Um, you know, one of the things that is interesting about me and, and, and part of my identity that has been hard to talk about, um, but in recent years, it has been a little easier is that, you know, I am diagnosed, uh, you know, with major depressive disorder and with generalized anxiety disorder, which is a part of me that, um, you know, like I said, it took me a very long time to really admit that to myself. And part of me talking about that vulnerability earlier was, you know, having spaces where, you know, you can trust people, where you can yeah. share that and say, you know, this, this may be a reason, you know, that I'm showing up the way that I, that I am. And, you know, I want you to know this about me because I trust you. Um, and I did place my trust in, in a leader of mine who, who abused that trust. And, and when I was, you know, at one of, um, you know, one of my lowest points, you know, while interacting with this leader, you know, kind of threw that in, in my face. And, uh, and that was really, really hard. Uh, it was really hard. Um, and it took me a minute to think through, um, you know, my empathy and to think through, okay, you've, you've said this to me, there's something behind it. A lot of times when, when people say things that are um, unfavorable, there's something behind it. And let's think through, you know, where are you coming from? Let's listen between the lines. What are you saying without actually saying it? And that gave me the ability to, uh, to see him in a different light and to see that, you know, um, he wasn't trying to be malicious, he was fearful. He was fearful. And I think recognizing fear in others can help us to show up the way that we want to, to, to advocate for ourselves, of course, but to support our fellow humans. And so uh, that's what I chose to do uh, in that moment in a follow-up conversation. And that's the way that I still, you know, choose to see that situation and see him. Um, and that has been a big lesson for me when it comes to the way that I like to show up for others and how I like for people to, to show up uh, for me. That is so beautiful. And I think it's a great note to end on. Um, I, I agree, Shanisha, she placed in chat, that's next level grace, it really truly is. But um, to, to amplify, when someone shares vulnerably with you, they're doing so because they trust you. They trust us, right, with that information. We have a responsibility to not breach that trust. Mm -hmm. This has been so great, Cosette. I am so glad you're part of the NWC team. Mm -hmm. Look forward to creating um, greater um, opportunity of, of helping to really seed DEIB in a really effective manner across many organizations that we have the privilege of supporting. Thank you for sharing this conversation with me. Thank you to each of you for joining us. I hope that you have a safe and healthy and great weekend, and we look forward to seeing you all back next Friday for intentional conversations. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.